Welcome to episode 30 of the GT on 5G. It's the latest inside scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, uh, logging in from sunny and cool Fort Collins, Colorado. And joining me again this week is fellow analyst, Angel Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. Um, it was announced this week that the House passed a $750 million open RAN bill. And, you know, it's no, it's no secret that Open RAN, um, you know, is gaining momentum. I actually hosted a podcast last week for an event out of Latvia called 5G Detectory, where we discussed the pros and cons of it. But what does this bill mean for adoption? So as I read into it, it's going to provide subsidies and grants to um, move um, the Open RAN initiative along. And, um, you know, 750 million, you know, when you kind of compare it to the billions of dollars that operators around the world are spending to deploy 5G, doesn't sound a, uh, like a lot on the surface, but I do think it will, uh, it'll put attention um, on the initiative and it should drive adoption. What are your thoughts, Angel? I do think it's a very small sum of money, um, but I also think that they are clearly seeing this as a opportunity to spur smaller players mm -hmm. um, into getting involved in the industry or increasing their investment or seed funding. But realistically, I just don't see how it's really enough money remotely. Mm -hmm. It needs at least another zero to be impactful, I think. Uh, but, you know, the reality is, is that when it comes to government funding and allocation is always going to be less than what's needed because people are going to generally err on the side that the government is wasting funds, right? So yeah. um, I think that's something to consider. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, th there have been other initiatives like the $1 billion earmarked for rural um, deployment as well. And I think we've talked about that on prior podcasts as well, sort of a you know, drop in the bucket, but um, you know, I you know, obviously the U.S. is 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 putting itself behind up and ran because it's going to drive a domestic, you know, we sourced and develop potential supply chain to support 5G and 6G and other G's, you know, down the road. So I kind of view it as um, maybe sort of a jump start, you know, from from you know the federal government's perspective. But it'll be interesting to to see how this really gets allocated and how impactful it is. So we'll keep our eyes on it. And if we have updates, we'll, we'll bring those into another podcast. But let's move to your first topic this week. And you want to talk about millimeter wave and Nokia, Qualcomm, and an operator, Elisa, in Europe. Yeah, so there's an operator in Finland called Elisa, who is the, one of the largest carriers in the country, if not the largest. And they deploy a millimeter wave commercial network in partnership with Nokia and Qualcomm, and they were able to deliver a eight gigabit per second millimeter wave bandwidth. People are calling this a record. Yeah. Um, but the problem is, is that it, it required two 800 megahertz blocks of 26 gigahertz spectrum. So it was two devices combining together to make eight gigabits per second, mm -hmm. which means that each device was getting four gigabits per second which is still really impressive and shows the scalability of millimeter wave, you know, to build capacity and create fast downloads and get users on and off the network very quickly. Yeah. But I think there was a little bit too much attention paid to the eight gigabits per second number because it's not for an individual device. And I would much rather see a much higher number for more devices than eight gigabits for two devices. Mm -hmm. uh, I think something that like T-Mobile had shown earlier in the year where they had, I wanna say eight devices with at 5.6 gigabits. To me, that sounds much more like a real use case or a real user environment. Yeah. So because of that, I just, I, this just sounds like it's kind of chasing a a higher number, even if it's kind of in, in a scenario where it's not one device, but it's also not enough devices to really matter. Yeah, I call it racing stripes, you know, and it's like, 
it's sort of like, you know, when, when earnings come out, or UCLA comes out and, you know, all the carriers, at least in the U.S., you know, that they, they make all these claims. And we actually, we actually have a blog that will be posting on Forbes on Friday that you and I both co-wrote where we sat down with Noble Ray and we sort of talked about sort of all of the, you know, uh, you know, factors that, that go into de deploying, you know, you know, 5G and why, you know, I think expectations haven't been met to present. But like we've spoken about in the past, 5G is, is, is a journey. You know, it's, uh, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, things roll out. Now, I know Qualcomm has been very focused on um, improving performance within the millimeter wave band. Um, are there any specific um, technologies that Qualcomm is bringing to market to make this a reality? Yeah, so this is a, a combination of uh, them utilizing their millimeter wave antenna modules, mm -hmm. which are very small um, and allow for integration into multiple devices. And they obviously also have the modem as well. So they have the device side, but they also have some of their brand technologies as well. But my understanding is most millimeter wave stuff right now is still operating on legacy um, RAN as opposed to open RAN. Yeah. Um, and this deployment specifically isn't even really a commercial deployment because it's while it is running on a commercial network, the operator is not actually running a, um, you know, an, a, a nationwide or citywide millimeter wave network yet. They won't be doing that until next year. And they were using two Nokia Airscale radios to do this. So it wasn't even a single like node. Yeah. Um, so it, it definitely doesn't feel like a true commercial deployment. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And uh, you made an interesting point on, you know, sort of Open RAN. So Open RAN won't necessarily be optimized for performance. Uh, performance. It's going to be optimized for CapEx and, and OpEx, right? So based on the application and, and the telco workload, um, Open RAN may not be, you know, a great solution just because it's not necessarily optimized around performance. So interesting. Well, let's move to my second topic this week. And um, a startup, Salona, that I've spoken to in the past, um, announced uh, a partnership with HPE Aruba to deliver an integrated private networking platform. The way they're going to deliver it is SaaS. So, you know, sort of a quasi managed service, you know, similar to like what Federated Wireless is, uh, is attempting to do. Um, so how is this different? Well, from my perspective, um, Salona is very focused on making the deployment and management of a private cellular network as easy as Wi-Fi. And, um, and, and, they've, and they've also got some really cool technologies uh, that they refer to as micro slicing, very similar to, to, to the network slicing um, scenarios that you and I have talked about in, in prior podcasts. And so I think this could be a game changer for, for two reasons. One, um, it's gonna bring simplification um, to allow enterprises you know, to, to be able to manage a fully integrated solution. And number two, they're leveraging HPE's IT channel infrastructure. So they're going to re reach tens of thousands of, uh, of reseller partners. And so I think from a scale perspective and a positioning perspective, this is a winner. Um, I don't know if you caught the news, but do you have any, any feedback or comments? I haven't, but I do think it's good for there to be more players in the space uh, to create more competition in the private networking space. Um, because I think that you know, there's there's a lot of attempts on the commercial consumer space to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, there are there needs to be competition in the private space as well. And the more you know integrated solutions there are, the easier it'll be to deploy. And I, I just think it'll it'll benefit 5G overall. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know, it's no secret that Nokia Enterprise, when you look at the kind of the purpose built um, cellular infrastructure providers, is sort of really leading the pack there. But what I really like about this partnership is the sales motion, you know, you know, to an enterprise install base with HPE. So, you know, HPE is not going to necessarily lead with it, but um, and they're going to sell, you know, their core, the core offerings, you know, Wi-Fi six offerings, those sorts of things. But for customers that that are exploring private cellular networking that have a, a use case or a deployment scenario um, that would 
would be beneficial with LTE or, or private 5G. Um, I think it's a great solution. I think it's a great strategy and uh, we'll keep our eyes on it and I'll report back as, as things develop there. Let's move to your second topic and um, you know, mention a Huawei in the news again, but um, you've got an update on, um, on Qualcomm and um, 4G chipsets. Yeah, so as you know, as many of you know, uh, Qualcomm and many other chip vendors have been trying to get permission to sell chips to Huawei now that they can no longer manufacture their own chipsets at TSMC. Mm -hmm. And Qualcomm was actually granted a right or permission by the US government to sell their 4G chipsets, not their 5G chipsets, to Huawei for the purpose of manufacturing smartphones. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that Qualcomm is not stating which chipsets those might be, um, but what's really fascinating is that Qualcomm's own chipsets, depending on which one you look at, some of them don't actually have a modem integrated because they're, what they're doing is they split out the modem and they have the modem sitting on a separate chipset from the SOC. So you can actually see some higher end chipsets that are not 5G uh, potentially running in a Huawei device. The issue is, is that you know, some devices like 765G have a modem integrated and that's just a no-go right there. Yeah. But an 865, theoretically, even though it is the top end chipset from Qualcomm, does not have a 5G modem inside of it. The modem is separate, mm -hmm. but it is marketed as a 5G modem or a 5G SOC. So it's, it's kind of murky waters. And we don't really know what chipsets they are selling to them. So it's, it's a very difficult scenario to really understand. But Qualcomm is not alone in being able to supply chipsets. There's others like Micron, Samsung, SK Hynix, and even, I believe, Intel. Yeah. So we're not looking at just one exception, but it is very clear that a lot of companies are being restricted from selling 5G-specific equipment to Huawei, which is an interesting and you know complicated discussion that we don't have time for. But I, I do believe that it's a little bit more difficult to claim that Huawei is doing something nefarious if they're running on US based chipsets. Right. You know, um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if the Biden Harris ticket is uh, is validated and they do um, they do take office in January, if the US stance, you know, will will change, you know, towards China. Like we don't we also don't want to get into a political discussion on that, but um, I, I find it interesting. I mean I, I wouldn't necessarily call this a slippery slope, but uh, and I also expect that, you know, Huawei is probably very aggressively investigating, you know, turning their high silicon um, design uh, division um, into a fab. I mean, that would take a monumental effort. Um, and billions not, of dollars. Billions really? of dollars, but, but also just acumen, right? You know, and, right. and China hasn't demonstrated acumen in semi. Well, so, what I would also say is, if you look at it, like the whole TikTok ban, Mm -hmm. The Trump, Trump administration used a lot of the same arguments. And the weird situation is that they kind of gave up on that. Like, they're not really pursuing it anymore. Right. So it's a very weird situation. I wish there was more consistency across a lot of these lawsuits and regulations. But fundamentally, American companies are selling Huawei chips again. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, they keep getting these exceptions. So um, we'll we'll keep uh, our eyes on this, and you know, and if we have updates on future podcasts, we'll we'll bring that back into the discussion. Let me hit my third topic this week, and it's news around Dish. And you know, I spoke about Dish a week or two ago, and found it very curious that you know they're they're setting expectations very low for their 5G deployment, uh, you know, second half of of next year. But uh, this week. Um, they announced uh, an agreement with Crown Castle that operates, you know, uh, cell towers around the country um, that they are leasing space on up to 20,000 cell towers. And, um, and this should absolutely help, you know, with their, their deployment. Um, it's going to be quite expensive when you start adding up the numbers. 
Um, and we've talked about this as well, you know, DISH is at risk in losing over 3 billion in spectrum, right? You know, they've been, you know, they've been kind of chided for, um, you know, sitting on spectrum for a number of years before the, the T-Mobile Sprint merger even came together. And what that threw off obviously was um, some spectrum assets as well as allowing DISH access to retellocations and uh, to operate sort of as an MDNO on their LTE network. But um, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it explains the whole situation we were dealing with last week when we talked about DISH and how we didn't understand how their CapEx was going to be so low. Yeah. And now we understand why, because they're going to lease a bunch of sites and reduce their CapEx. But that said, there still is a CapEx involved, even if you are leasing sites. Oh, yeah. It does save you money on the CapEx side, but it increases your OpEx. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what that OpEx CapEx balance actually is and what total investment looks like. But I do believe that they have to roll out their spectrum sooner or later, or else they're going to lose more mm -hmm. spectrum. Yeah. Because that $3.3 billion potential loss is because they lost a case that basically said that they shouldn't have gotten the discounts they were given because they didn't hit their, 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 you know, requirements. Okay. And they're, you know, I think they're at risk of doing that again. So I don't know what to say or do about dish, but I, it, it's, it's very, it's a very confusing company and I hope that they do eventually, you know, get things together a bit and we're able to kind of understand where they're really going. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, you know, I think Dish is good for the market. It's going to keep the other, um, you know, tier ones uh, honest. So um, we'll, we'll continue to monitor that um, and report back. Your final topic this week, you want to talk about Verizon and Apple Enterprise and how they're going to drive um, iPhone 12 upgrades. Yeah, so this was uh, something that I got you know, notice of yesterday, and it happened today, which is basically that Verizon's partnering with Apple to do complete and total fleet swaps for enterprises. Because as you know, lots of companies deploy iPhones for their employees, and a lot of them are pretty out of date. And this seems like an opportunity for Verizon to significantly increase the number of 5G users that they have on their network. Mm -hmm. and convert everyone over to 5G and show, you know, big 5G subscriber numbers, but also convince others to move over to Verizon because they're giving everybody free iPhone 12s. Yeah. My understanding is the iPhone 12 or the iPhone 12 mini will be basically at zero upfront cost or zero cost in general uh, or be very low, but it, it seems like it's really designed to, to get customers to refresh, get 5G service and get, potentially pull big enterprise accounts toward the horizon. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a smart strategy on Verizon's part, you know, like you said, to get, to get more people moved over to 5G, sort of accelerate that. Um, you know, AT&T has been really aggressive too in the consumer space. You know, they've, they've got a promotion right now where, you know, you, you know, you basically, you know, turn your, your phone in and it can, you know, it, it can be a very low end, you know, LTE phone. And you practically get an iPhone 12, you know, for free as well. You know, that, you know, kind of that, 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 that basic model or the mini, I mean, not the super max, huge pro, you know, device, but, but, um, but yeah, it just seems like, you know, the operators are really wanting to aggressively move subscribers over to new hardware and that's going to drive service revenue for them as well. I mean, access is one thing, you know, faster, better, but, um, but then, you know, these operators, the way they're really going to monetize their investments is, to deliver consumer enterprise, you know, 5G services that take advantage of that, you know, sub five millisecond latency and that, that throughput that in, you know, uh, a non standalone, you know, network is, is easily eight or 10 times as fast as LTE. And as they move to standalone, I've heard numbers 50, 60, 100 times faster. So, um, you know, I, you know, it's, I think it's smart on their part. So. But uh, that's another great podcast this week. Why don't you take us home? We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide insight on a specific 5G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. 
Will is at Will Town Tech, and I'm at Anfil Saab. We hope you have a great weekend, and please tune in again next week.